think before uh, George today couldn't make it, so I'm taking over the TUE part for today. And so welcome to this session of the DSDSD seminar. And it's my pleasure today, we have only one speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Arijit. I'm, I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, who is from Alborg uh, in Denmark and is gonna give us a presentation today about data management problem, problems for emerging, sorry, <laughs> data management for emerging problems in large networks. So without further ado, uh, Arijit, the, the stage is yours. Good. So thanks Daniela for the introduction and welcome to my talk on data management for emerging problems in large networks. My name is Orijit Khan, and I'm a faculty uh, from Alberg University in the Department of Computer Science. It's my great pleasure to be here and discuss about uh, some of my research with this audience. So thanks for having me here. Before I start, some background about myself. I did my PhD from UC Santa Barbara, and during that time, I also did a couple of internships at IBM DJ Watson in New York and also at Yahoo Labs in Barcelona. Then I did a postdoc in the systems group at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And until recently, I was an assistant professor at Nanyang Technological University, which is NTU in Singapore. And then uh, very recently, I joined Alborg University as an associate professor. So let's start. Today, we are in the era of big data. And big data can often be modeled as big graphs because of the interconnections that are present among various entities in the data set. For example, we can think of data as knowledge graphs, such as Freebase, DBpedia, Microsoft's ProBase, Google has its own Google knowledge graph, then Amazon introduced Amazon co-purchase network. And these days, all small and big companies mostly have their own knowledge graphs. Outside knowledge graphs, we also find graph structure data in social networks, chemical compound structure, program flow analysis, biological networks, transportation networks, images, and even in machine learning, there are many algorithms that work with large-scale graph structure data. Now, all these graphs, they are not just the graph structure or topology consisting only nodes and edges. Rather, they are a complex combination of structure and content. So that means with every node, with every edge, and with the graph itself, we can associate a lot of information. And if it's a complex combination of structure and content, new kinds of graph queries and analytics are emerging, which are difficult to be answered by the traditional database management systems. So novel graph databases and distributed graph systems are also emerging. Now, in this space, I work on three specific areas, approximate query, efficient query, and user-friendly query. Approximate query is important because these graphs are very large, noisy, and often they do not have any standardized schema. The users also often do not know what exactly they are looking for. So given a user's query, there may not be an exact match in the data. However, the system still needs to return the top K most relevant or approximate answers, and that is why we need approximate query answering system. Then efficient querying, of course, it is very important because the users would like to get very fast answers and we need to support such efficient query answering over graph data. Last but not least, user-friendly query answering is extremely important because these graphs are very complex and often they do not have any standard schema. So schema-centric or query language-based query answering techniques such as SQL or SparkWell often do not work that well. And we need to support much more user-friendly query answering interfaces, such as querying based on examples, based on keywords, natural languages, etc. So in my research, I'm working on these three aspects, approximate querying, efficient querying, and user-friendly querying. And we design scalable, effective, efficient, and approximate algorithms, interpretable machine learning tools, as well as large-scale in-memory distributed systems to support various novel graph queries and analytics. So what new graph queries and analytics we are talking here? Well, we can think of graph pattern matching query. Suppose uh, you are driving to your university and on your way, you want to find some Asian restaurants that your friends rated very highly. So to answer this query, 
you need information both from your social network as well as from Google Maps. Now, how to even write this query on your smartphone device? And given this query, how the system can return the top five most relevant answers? So these are very challenging problems. Or given a software, can you detect some malware inside that software? Then in the domain of graph pattern mining query, by looking at the musical social network such as last.fm, can you say that Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, and Britney Spears are similar type of singers? Or given a state of transactions, can you identify the root cause of transaction failure? Then moving one step ahead in the domain of graph reachability query, can we identify the top 10 most influential persons in a social network like in last.fm or in Twitter or in Facebook? Well, if you are a company and if you want to promote your product, then possibly you can reach out to those top 10 most influential persons. You can influence them by giving free samples, discounts, advertisements, etc. And then they will start saying a lot of good things about your product in the network. So many other people in the network will also get to know about your product and they will eventually purchase your product. And recently, we also looked into the problem of finding not only the top K most influential persons, but also top R most relevant topics. So to influence a specific group of people. So for example, we know that in 2016 US presidential election, Hillary Clinton lost. And she lost because of three blue one states, primarily because of these three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So a relevant topic of investigation could be what kind of campaign topics Hillary Clinton could have promoted more so to win more votes from these three blue wall states. And last but not least, by analyzing the communication pattern of a group of people in the area of graph streams, can you identify that something suspicious is going on and possibly that resembles to some sort of terrorist activities? So clearly, these are very interesting emerging uh, problems in the areas of graphs. And in our research, we are designing scalable, effective, efficient, user-friendly, and also interpretable algorithms, machine learning tools, and large-scale distributed systems to support such queries and analytics. So just to give you an overview, our research in the area of big graphs can be categorized into four broad areas. We are working on scalable approximate graph query. We are working on uncertain graph processing, complex graphs mining, and also to support this kind of novel queries and analytics, we are building large-scale uh, in-memory distributed systems. So for example, in the area of graph querying, we are working on knowledge graph search, graph query by example, graph stream query, also spatial and road network queries. Then on uncertain graphs, we are working on reliability and shortest path queries, influence maximization, and also influence graph embedding. So this graph embedding or graph representation learning is a very hot topic these days. And here we work on uh, the problem of influence graph embedding. Then in the area of complex graphs mining, we proposed some novel graph patterns such as proximity patterns, correlation patterns, and we show their usefulness in the biological domain, in graph anomaly detection, in graph-based entity resolution, etc. We are also working on graph summarization for decomposition as well as multi-layer networks. Then in distributed graph systems, we looked into effective partitioning problem because in a distributed system, you need to partition the graph across multiple machines and what is an effective partition. Then we also looked into the problem of decoupling graph query versus graph storage, right? So that uh, you can actually bypass some of these complex problems of graph partitioning and repartitioning. Outside the domain of graphs, we also worked on relational data, stream data, blockchain networks. In fact, this financial network mining is a very hot topic these days, crowdsourcing and also email or machine learning on graphs. So in summary, right, uh, currently we are mostly working on some of these areas such as knowledge graph querying and embedding, including dynamic knowledge graphs, interpretable graph classifications, and also knowledge graph based question answering. And these are under some of the broad topics like graph representation learning, knowledge graph based question answering and explainable AI. Of course, in this talk due to interest of time, I will not go over all of these uh, directions or, or works in these domains, rather I shall primarily focus on our work on querying knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs are very important, right? And we know that Google started um, way back in 2012 with knowledge graph based query answering techniques. 
And then in 2013, Facebook introduced Facebook graph search, where you can write textual queries, such as people who like things I like, and you can get direct answers to your queries. And then in 2016, during Panama paper investigation, the researchers used graph-based techniques, and they identified important hidden links across different rich people and rich companies. Then another application of graph search or graph query could be malware detection. Given a software, there are many ways how we can detect a malware. But one possible approach could be consider the call graph of the software, which is how the control flows from one subroutine to another subroutine. Similarly, we can also get a call graph of the malware, and then we need to detect whether the malware call graph is embedded inside the call graph of the original software. So clearly, graph search is very important from various perspectives. Now, let's see, what are the challenges in graph search? Well, if you think of the traditional relational data, things are really standard there, right? Researchers are working on relational data for more than 50 years now. Uh, they have very standard schema. Usually, these are very strict and often small. We know how to write queries using SQL. We mostly know how to do query optimization over relational data. So this is very standard. On the other hand, when you talk about knowledge graphs, these are very large, heterogeneous, meaning there are entities of many different types, and even the same types of entities can be connected in many different ways. So in other words, often the knowledge graphs do not have any standardized schema. And even if they have a schema, the schema can be quite large due to such heterogeneity. So uh, these kind of schema-centric query answering techniques often do not work well. And in addition, there are problems due to noise, dynamic updates, massive volume of these knowledge graphs. So all these problems basically boil down to one of the fundamental problems in database, which is the end users of the database are not the designers of the database. So the end users, although they know that the information is somewhere in the database, they do not know how to query it and extract relevant information. So in our research, we are mostly solving this unable to query problem, but of course, in the context of graph data and graph databases. So to appreciate this problem or to understand its challenges, let's look at a toy example from the DBpedia knowledge graph. So here we have different cars. They are manufacturers, companies, and the country. And let's say we are interested in the following query, find all cars that are produced in Germany. Now, one possible way to answer this query is to create a query graph, right? Because my data is also a knowledge graph. And the user can write uh, or, or create two nodes, right? One is the car node, the name is not known. Another is the country node, the name is Germany. And then they are connected by an age called product. But if the user is smart, she can observe this knowledge graph and she can think, well, uh, she can find out that there is no product age, but there is a synonymous age called assembly. So perhaps you will replace the product age with an assembly age in the query graph. Now, if this is my query graph, and if I find structurally similar matches from the knowledge graph, we find only one valid answer, right? So this, in this case, the answer is BMW 320 because this is directly connected by, uh, by the age uh, assembly to, to country channel, right? So this is a perfect structural match. But there are also other valid answers in the knowledge graph. For example, ODPT, this is a German card, but this is not directly connected to German, right? So we, we see that first it is connected to the Volkswagen company based on the age assembly. And then the company Volkswagen is connected to country Germany based on the age country. Similarly, we have another valid answer, Porsche 911. And this is connected to, to the company Porsche based on the manufacturer age. And then the company is connected to country Germany based on the location age. So although these are valid answers and the semantic meaning of such paths are same as the query age assembly, but if you just find a strict structural match, probably you won't be able to find such valid answers. So the question is, given such a query, how can we find semantically similar matches? And this is very challenging. So we're working on this problem for quite some time now. Our early words, Mace and Nima, published in Sigmod and TLDB, these are based on approximate neighborhood-based graph matching. Then we introduced a new paradigm to add the user friendliness, and we call it graph query by example. And we had our paper uh, or, or, our, or our project called GQB published in ICD and TKDE. And then very recently, we are looking into this aspect of semantic search, right? And we had a couple of papers recently in ICDE. 
So here we looked into semantic search over knowledge graph embedding. We also added two additional features such as time bounded search, meaning the user gives some time bound and you need to provide the best possible answers within that time bound. We also looked into aggregate queries over knowledge graphs. And recently we also looked into the problem of dynamic updates of knowledge graph embedding because these embeddings are used to answer queries. So now if there is any update in the knowledge graph, you also need to update the embedding quickly. So how to deal with all these problems, that's what I'm going to discuss in the next 10 to 15 minutes, okay? So let's start with our early works uh, of NACE and NEMA that are based on approximate neighborhood-based matching. So here our idea is quite simple, right? We want some approximate match, meaning some relaxed notion of graph matching, and we allow certain noise and small mismatch. So the idea is if two nodes are close in the query graph, they should also be close in the data graph. So instead of preserving the exact structure, we preserve the proximity or the closeness among nodes. So how to preserve such closeness? Well, we convert the neighborhood of each node as a vector. And by neighborhood, we do not mean that immediate neighborhood of one node, but it could be even up to a certain number of hops, like two hops. So here we see the two hop neighborhood of node U1, and we find uh, other nodes like U2, U3, and U4, and we want to preserve closeness or proximity. So one idea could be, well, let's just consider the shortest path distance and then create some vector embedding based on that shortest path distance. So for example, U2 and U3, they have higher score because they are closer to U1, and U4 is, has a bit lower score because this is a bit further. But of course, you can have more sophisticated ideas like random work based embedding as well. And in fact, I'd like to mention that this work was really the predecessor of all these knowledge graph embedding techniques that are very popular these days, because they're also doing uh, some sort of neighborhood embedding, but of course, in a more sophisticated way. So what we proposed way back in 2011 and 13 is kind of embedding, but, but uh, in a more simplistic manner. So once we define the embedding or we convert the neighborhood as a vector for every node, then we define the cost of matching two nodes, right? So V would be a node from the query graph and U is a node from the data graph. And the cost of matching two nodes depends on two factors. One is how well their labels can be matched. And this can be computed based on simple string edit distance or more complex ontological similarity. And the second aspect of the cost is how well the neighbors can be matched. Right? And because we already converted the neighborhood as a vector, we can do very fast algebraic computation of our vector space. So this gives us a very good speed up in terms of graph matching. Now, we define the cost of matching the entire query graph, which is the cost of matching individual query nodes. We show that this problem is still NP hard and also approximation hard, meaning it's very unlikely that we can find a polynomial time constant factor approximate solution. So we, we consider some heuristics, but we take ideas from the machine learning domain. In particular, we look into the problem of inferencing over random Markov field. So what are the similarities of our problem versus inferencing over random Markov field? Well, in our problem, we, where we want to find the, the, the best possible match with respect to the query graph, we want to minimize the cost right, the, the, which is the ultimate or the global objective function. But this cost of matching the query graph can be decomposed into the cost of matching individual query nodes, right? That's how we formulate the problem. Now, the cost of matching individual query node depends on the matching of that node and its neighbor up to a certain number of hops. So although the objective function is global, it can be decomposed into a set of local factors, right, a subset of nodes and so on. Similarly, in case of inferencing over random Markov field, you want to maximize the joint probability distribution of a, of a set of variables, but that joint probability distribution can be decomposed into a set of local factors that depends only on a subset of variables. So this is a clear similarity that you observe, and that's why we borrowed some of the ideas of inferencing over random Markov field to solve our problem. In particular, we developed a technique which is very similar to uh, iterative loopy belief propagation algorithm. Now in this talk, I shall not go into details of mathematical uh, or algorithmic things, rather I shall give you uh, the high level of view, right? So I'm not going to the details of our technique, but in terms of the complexity, it was polynomial to the, to the number of nodes and edges in, in the query graph as well as in the data graph. And of course it's an iterative algorithm. So T is, is the number of iterations that you need to get a good convergence. And we find that for knowledge graphs, usually it's uh, it's quite small, like usually two to three iterations you need to get a good match. And the reasons are as follows. So first, the knowledge graphs are sparse. 
And the second thing is um, we are already finding some good initial matches based on the label matching, right? So the number of candidates per node is already quite limited, and then we are the refining it based on these sort of iterations. Of course, this can also be further improved in terms of running time by using some uh, distributed platforms such as Frigel or GraphLab, which are front-extended graph processing systems. We did experiments to show how good it works and, and, and how, how it compares against some existing systems. So what we did, we, we took an original knowledge graph and then we extracted some small subgraphs and then we added some noise in that extracted subgraph. And then we, we find out, can we, still, can we still identify the region from where this, this query graph was, was extracted? Because now the query graph has some knowledge. It may not match exactly um, against the region from where it has been extracted. So we compared our method NEMA against a number of uh, state-of-that methods at that time, and we found that it works quite well in terms of both accuracy and running time. So one reason why it worked quite well in terms of accuracy is because we are uh, supporting some sort of noise in the structure, right? Whereas these existing methods such as SAGA, ISORAN, GSTOP, these are more like strict and notion of matching. And those are necessary in biological domains, right? For example, if you are looking for, let's say, uh, some sort of engine rig kind of structure, you really need to preserve that structure. But why does in, in knowledge graphs where we, you can have some sort of noise, right? They are such strict matching does not work well. So we, we get good uh, accuracy. In terms of running time, again, we are quite efficient. And the reason is we are doing graph matching over vector space. So we get very good speed up compared to some of those existing methods, which are still doing the computation over graph space. So this solved our problem or approximate query. But what about the other paradigms, such as user friendly query and semantic query? So let's move on to the other paradigms. So in terms of user-friendly query, uh, the idea is, well, uh, in our, if you think of our previous, uh, previous uh, example or previous query, right, the user still needs to provide a query graph. Now, if you think of the traditional query languages, you still need to write your query in SQL or SparkWave. That might be too much for nine users or other domain experts from biology, from social scientists, etc., who might not have that much expertise in how to write a query graph or how to write a query in smart way. So we proposed a system called graph query by example, where we assume that, well, the user may find it difficult to write a query in a query language, but they might already know some relevant answers that they are looking for, right? So why don't we start with those answers? For example, here, let's say the user is looking for all the Turing Award winners and they are graduating universities. And we know, or the user knows that one such answer could be Donald Luth, Turing Award, and Stanford University. So in our system, the user can input such tuples, right? And then the system can automatically identify important relations among those entities and build the query graph. And once the query graph is constructed, then we can apply our previous technique of approximate graph matching to identify other relevant answers. And it actually works quite well, right? So we, we tested it on previous knowledge graph and we find other similar entities or tuples like Dennis Ritchie, also a Turing Award winner from Harvard University, then Peter North, Turing Award winner from Mills for Institution and so on. So one question that you might ask, well, why we are still getting the same Turing Award in this column, but then other things are valid. Well, we can also weight the importance of different uh, entities in our example. And, and if something is weighted higher, then we expect or the user expects that this, this entity will remain in the, in the answer. So that's how we can actually model our query graph and we can find similar relevant answers. Of course, we'd like to mention that the idea of query by example is nothing new, right? It has been used a lot in the past in other domains, such as, uh, such as in relational data and web tables, etc. The novelty of our work was we applied the idea of query by example over knowledge graph search. Okay, so that is good so far. Now let's move on to our recent works on semantic querying. So let's revisit the problem of uh, querying this toy example from DBpedia knowledge graph where we have many cars and then we have their companies, their, um, their countries, etc. And we want to find uh, those answers that are relevant, but they do not match structure, right? For example, ODTT, it's a valid answer, but the path connecting ODTT and Germany is structurally different than the query age. So how do we find such semantically similar paths given a query age? Here, what we propose is a knowledge graph embedding based technique. So recently knowledge graph embedding is quite popular. And the idea is you assign vector representation to every node and every edge in the knowledge graph and, and in the vector space, right? 
the semantic meanings are preserved, right? That means if the, the meaning, semantic meaning of some nodes or some edges are similar, then they should have very small distance in that vector space. So we take help of this idea, right? So we can, you can embed the knowledge graph using some state of the art knowledge graph embedding technique, but then you can take help of that embedding to find other semantically similar parts. So for example, once we embed the query edge and also embed every relation in the knowledge graph, then we can, we can find semantic similarity between two vectors, right? Using some standard methods such as cosine similarity. And then you can also find the semantic similarity of a path given a query edge. And in this case, we consider the geometric mean of the similarity of every edges that are present on that path. And in this way, we can find those paths that are semantically more similar or close with respect to the query edge. So to find the top case semantically similar paths given a query edge, we use some A star search based uh, technique that can identify the most important paths quickly. And if your query graph consists of multiple edges, then for each edge, you can find such top k most uh, semantically similar paths, and then you can join them using some special algorithm. So you can find the overall match with respect to the query graph. We also added another aspect, which is time boundedness. And this was the first time uh, in our knowledge where we added this, uh, this criteria of time boundedness, meaning the user provides some time bound, and the system needs to return the answers within that time bound. And then if the user is happy, that's good. But if the user is not happy, she can increase the time bound and the system can incrementally improve the quality of the results. And this is possible in our system because we are using a star search to find the relevant or semantically similar parts with respect to a query. And if the time bound is already reached, we may not complete the entire a star search. We can provide the results till then, right? Of course, those will not be the perfect answers, but still some some sort of accurate results within that time bound. And then as the time is increased, if the user is not happy, then we can continue with our extra search and we can gradually refine our results. So in, we did experiments and we compare our method, which is SGQ, semantic guided graph search, against a number of state-of-the-art methods. And we find that our accuracy results in terms of precision and recall are quite good. The reason is we are finding much more relevant answers, right? Much more valid answers. Probably they have different schema, they have different structure. So if you follow some stricter notion of structural similarity or schema-based query answering, then they do not, then, then those systems are not able to find those relevant answers, which we are able to identify. So naturally our accuracy is high. And another important thing is time boundedness, right? So if the user provides some time bound, then, do, then we actually respect the time bound. And of course, as the time bound is increased, as the time is increased, then we can gradually improve the quality of our results. So, so with more time on the x-axis, we can see that the quality of the results, such as precision recall and F1, are also gradually increased. So this actually solves two aspects, which is one is semantic uh, guided search, and another is also users given, respecting users given time mark. So our late, in our latest work, In ICD 2022, which is this year, we further look into the problem of aggregate queries over knowledge graph embedding. So aggregate queries are more difficult than the, than the classical factored queries, because in factored queries, you are just looking for the state of answers. For example, find all cars produced in Germany, the example that I gave before. But in aggregate query, we are now looking for some aggregate or some statistics over those answers, like how many cars are produced in Germany, or what is the average horsepower of cars produced in Germany. These are also very interesting problems, and people often find those sort of aggregates as opposed to looking into all the answers, because all the answers will be too many in numbers, and that might just overwhelm the, the, the user. So, one classical approach to solve such aggregate query would be, well, you just find all the answers and then you apply the aggregate, right? But that does not work quite well because of two reasons. One is the effectiveness issue. So what do you mean by all the answers? And as I have said before, in the context of knowledge graph, finding all valid answers itself is challenging, especially if you do not consider all possible ways how things are connected, you might miss a lot of important answers or a lot of relevant answers. And then the efficiency issue, right? So first you need to find all answers that is of course time consuming. And then you need to apply some aggregate operator on top of that. So of course this, this involves two-step operation and that is also quite time consuming. 
So as opposed to this classical approach, we, we propose a, a more like sampling estimation approach where we, instead of finding all answers or all relevant answers, we sample a few answers, right? And then we estimate the, the aggregate result based on those. And we also give some error bound to the user. And if the user is happy with the error bound, that's fine, we can stop. But if the user is not happy, then we can do more sampling and we, we can incrementally improve the quality of the answer. And we can also improve the error bound. So that's how we can propose, we, we, we solve this problem. So, so in the first step, which is the sampling stage, again, we take help of the knowledge graph embedding. And let's say that Germany is, 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 the, is the entity or the node that we can start with, right? So from this node is the knowledge graph, we do random work. And the random work is determined by the similarity of those vectors that we get based on knowledge graph embedding. So naturally, this will be biased towards those parts that are produced in Germany, or at least they have semantically similar notion as produced in Germany, right? So we identify such samples based on our random work, and then we estimate it, right? For example, we can do sum, count, average based on those samples. And we also apply some central limit theorem to, to give some confidence internal based error guarantee. In fact, we saw that if a uh, certain kind of error guarantees can be established, then, then, then this is within the user's given error bound in terms of relative error. If not, then we need to increase the number of samples. So then we can go back to our sampling stage and we can generate more samples. And then we can redo our estimation and at some point we reject the user's given error bound. So that's how we work in an iterative manner. We did experiments on knowledge graphs such as uh, DBPDR, FreeBase, Yahoo, and we use some standard benchmarks like QLD4 web questions. They have quite a few aggregate queries. And we find that our results are quite good in terms of relative error as well as response time. Of course, this is not a surprise given that uh, we have already we already know that our method can identify different ways how things are connected. So, so we are finding much more valid answers, and that's why when we do aggregate over them, our results are also good compared to some of those other methods. And because we are doing an approximate query processing, so we are not finding all the answers, right? We are still providing uh, some sort of approximate aggregate. We are also quite fast compared to some of those existing methods. We actually have a cool demonstration for those who are interested. This is the YouTube link, and this demonstration uh, paper is under submission. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we 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 actually not only like propose the technique, but we also build some sort of a system prototype and the demonstration so that if you are interested to play with, then you can also do that. In fact, in our demonstration, right, we, we went one step ahead and we allowed the users to input queries in multiple ways because that's very important, right? It's not, the, not that we expect users to write queries in, in sequence, particle, or, or do a query graph, but they can also provide keyword query. They can also write a natural language query and we extract important keywords from them and we create the query graph. And then, then we do all those stuff that we just discussed before. So, so we are providing much more user-friendly interfaces so that users can input their queries in many different ways and still get the relevant answers quickly. In terms of our ongoing works, uh, so we are making this framework human in the loop, much more user-friendly, right? So that means we can incorporate users' feedback and this feedback could be explicit or even implicit. For example, if I provide the top 10 most relevant answers, the user can click maybe top three or top four, even before top one or top two. And then the system should be able to identify that well, uh, those top three or top four are more important for that specific user. So perhaps the system can build a model for the user and provide much more personalized results in later iterations. We are also looking into uh, aspects like, uh, like providing some explanation to the answers, doing query recommendation, etc. So all of this will make our query knowledge graph framework much more user friendly and interactive. We're also uh, working in the problem of on the problem of dynamic updates of knowledge graph because as you as you saw before, we are using the knowledge graph embedding for query answering. Now, if the knowledge graph structure changes, we also need to update the embedding quickly, right? Otherwise the downstream applications results will be different, right? Will be faulty, such as question answering recommendation systems. So the question is, given a knowledge graph and its update, how can I quickly update the knowledge graph embedding? And when we apply some of the existing techniques like trans-e for knowledge graph embedding, and if there is an update, we find out that, okay, that update can be propagated through the whole knowledge graph, and then we need to update the vectors of all the nodes and edges, which is quite time consuming, only for the local update. So just to give you an idea, let's say that in trans-e, knowledge graph embedding, you need to preserve this translation property part triple 
H represents the head entity, R represents the relation, and, and T represents the tail entity. So the vector of head plus the vector of relation must be always equal right, to the vector of the tail entity. Now let's assume that we have already embedded the knowledge graph using trans E model. Um, and then this new edge, R5, that appeared, right, which you see in the red color between E6 and E3. Now, because R5 already existed before, right, in the knowledge graph, so, so R5 already had an embedding. Now, we also had an embedding for E3 and E6. So now, E6 plus R5 is equal to E3 may not be satisfied because we created those embeddings before. We need to do some updates either in E3 or in R5 or, or in E6. But if we do some changes in E3, then that might also need to we also need to uh, need to update the other embeddings like in r1 or in e4 and so on so in this way the embeddings update will get propagated in the whole network and that is quite time consuming so as opposed to this we proposed a new technique called uh, dynamic knowledge graph embedding or dkg where we can solve this problem right reasonably well so the idea is instead of one embedding we assign two embeddings part of nodes and part edges right and one we call knowledge embedding and another we call context embedding and we aggregate them, right? We combine them and we get the ultimate embedding, right? And for this ultimate embedding, H star, R star, H star, then we need to satisfy the property, uh, the translation property, like H star plus R star is equal to T star. So what is the benefit of this? So we find that for the, the benefit is, okay, the update can be limited within a local region if you have local updates within the knowledge graph. So for example, if you have an emerging entity, meaning completely new entity or completely new relation, of course, you need to learn uh, both the knowledge embedding and context embedding of that new entity or new relation. But then if you have some existing entity, but only the context is changed, then you only need to update this knowledge embedding, right? So, so that actually limits the, the, the total number of triples that you need to retrain, right? And that actually speed up the overall updating process of the knowledge graph. So this was the recent paper that we had published in, in Knowledge Based System 2022. And if you're interested, again, you can look into it. Okay, so that basically concludes the, the knowledge graph search part of my work. So how much time do I have? Can I take maybe another five minutes? Sure, sure, of course. Of course, go ahead. Okay, great. So, so I will I will conclude, but before that, I will just give you very high level glimpse of some of my some of our other works in other domains, such as in graph systems, in uncertain graphs, as well as in graph pattern mining, right? And then I will conclude. So, in area of graphs, in the area of graph systems, we we work into this idea of decoupling query processor from graph storage because you know in distributed systems, this is the classical framework where you just partition the graph across multiple machines and then uh, given a query, you look into like which machine is the best for for answering this query and probably you either dispatch the query there or fetch data from that machine and you answer the query. So that is the classical or the traditional system. But what happens is okay. First of all, this graph partition is quite expensive. And the second issue is one time graph partitioning is not enough because your graph can change over time. Some of your infrastructure can, can change over time. For example, new machines can be added or deleted, or even the workload can change over time. So, so you need to repartition the graph over time. You need to migrate the data from one machine to another, and that is even more time consuming and expensive. So as opposed to this, this infrastructure will ask the question, can it all together avoid the, the problem of expensive graph partitioning and repartitioning? Apparently it's said yes. So what we did is we decoupled query processor from graph storage, meaning we have some dedicated query processing server and we have some dedicated graph storage server. So because the query processor and the graph storage are separate, that means how I partition the graph across those graph storage does not really matter. The simple hash partitioning will be as good, almost as good as a more complex graph partitioning and repartitioning across those graph storage. But of course, there is one bottleneck, which is for every query processing in the query processor, you need to fetch the data from the graph storage. So to avoid this data fetching all the time, we also build good cache locality by doing smart query routing from the query processor. Here our idea is, okay, we are looking into local queries, like you start from a query node and you, you, you do two hop traversal from that query node. So for this type of queries, if you can do good locality when you route the queries, then you can build good cache uh, over time on those query processes. So most of the time you can answer queries uh, within the cache and you don't even need to fetch data from the graph storage. 
So to, to show our performance, right, uh, uh, let's look at the cal sheet, right? So if you increase the number of processors, then of course the graphics partition even more. So so normally what will happen is you in, you reduce the number of cal sheets, right? Because you have more number of processors, that means the data is more distributed. And, and because you are answering local queries, meaning you need to transfer from one node to another node, right? So most likely you, you end up finding it in another machine as you increase the number of file processors. But in our, our uh, most efficient routing studies, such as embedding based routing, we find that this cache does not decrease a lot, even if you increase the number of processors, because we are building good cache locality in the query processor by doing smart routing. And that's why we can get a uh, very good speed up as you increase the number of query processors. So that shows the benefit of our system. In terms of uncertain graphs, um, I'll be very quick, right? Uh, in, sort of in, in terms of uncertain graphs, we, we looked into the problem of inference maximization, but in the classical work, uh, usually researchers assume that, okay, there is a fixed inference um, from one user to another user, but this is not correct, right? For example, um, if, if you think of this specific toy example, maybe this user has more, more influence on, on the lady if he tweets something about uh, coffee or arts. But he, this uh, this person tweets about bus, probably the lady is not that interested in this example. So, so we, we not only need to consider the influence, but also what are the topics that are being talked about, right? And based on this idea, we, we found out that, okay, it's important to find influencer persons, but also important topics. So to influence a group of people. And we did experiments on some real data set uh, taken from Yelp social network. And here we looked into the problem of, okay, let's say I want to open a business in a city. So what will be the most interesting or important topics I should tweet about so that people are more attracted to that business in that city? So we looked into several cities and here I'll show the results for three cities. For Las Vegas, we found out that the important topics that people who are more attracted or interested are more related to travels um, and entertainment, such as travel, dance clubs, etc. Whereas for this one, these are more like daily items like Mexican seafood, grocery, coffee, and tea. So this clearly shows that the relevant topics um, that can attract a specific group of people could be different, right? Then we also looked into some of the classical problems such as, uh, sorry, this should be 2021, last year. So some of the classical problems such as shortest path and centrality on uncertain graphs. And, and, and we, 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 we designed algorithms that how to find those kind of things like shortest path over uncertain graphs. For example, find the part that has the highest probability of being shortest path between two nodes in an uncertain graph. Because here we not only have distances, but we also have probabilities on the edges. So the shortest path only comes in distance, like let's say this one, right? One and one to two, right? But these are very small probability. So probability is not that useful, right? Some other paths with high probability or a good balance between probability and distance might be more interesting in this scenario. So we applied our technique on, on a real brain network and what the results we got are very interesting. So here on the left-hand side, you see a good brain, right? And on the right-hand side, you see a brain with ASD symptom. And what you find out that, okay, if we find the shortest path between the same pair of nodes, the results are quite different. So on, on the left-hand side, in a regular brain, the shortest paths actually connect nodes that are in different regions. Whereas uh, on the right-hand side, with ASD symptom, we find shortest path consisting of small, small, small edges. And these edges are connecting nodes within the same region. And this is typical for, for ASD symptom because in biology, we find out that uh, the, the ASD symptom is characterized by over-connectivity within the same region and under-connectivity between two five regions. Right? So this shortest part that we find out actually shows the similar observations. And, the, and, and this can be utilized to detect good brain versus uh, brain with some disease such as in ASD symptoms. Okay, we are also working on, uh, on the graph mining side, we are also working on uh, like uh, more complex graphs such as higher order networks and multi-layer networks. So let me conclude. Okay, so the, what is the big picture of our research? So we are working in the big in the area of big data and big graphs. And, and first of all, this is very much data driven. There is no lack of data these days. Uh, for example, data coming from streams, uncertain data, semi-structured data, ontology, knowledge graphs, social networks, financial networks, etc. But there are two other important aspects, right? On the left hand side, you see uh, a bunch of um, bunch of topics, right, that are very relevant, such as machine learning, databases, graph algorithms, distributed systems. So these are also very much interdisciplinary and collaborative. And then uh, on the right hand side, we see several cool applications of this research. I discuss some of them in biology, in, in, in knowledge base, in social networks, right? So there are no lack of uh, applications, even in smart seeking kind of things, financial domains. 
So we need the main takeaways. Well, there are three main takeaways of this talk. First of all, big data can be modeled as big graphs. And there are many emerging queries and analytics and mining applications over those big graphs. And in our research, we are designing user-friendly, efficient, approximate, interpretable algorithms, machine learning techniques, and also large-scale distributed systems to support these novel queries and analytics. In terms of future directions, um, we are making this kind of knowledge graph search much more interactive and user-friendly. We are also working on more complex uh, uh, graphs such as, um, such as multi-layer networks and higher-order networks. And then we are also looking into machine learning over graphs. Some of the problems such as graph classification and then making it much more interpretable, right? So you, you not only want to get the results, but you want to understand why this graph is classified as a malware. Okay, so with that, I will I will end here. I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, everyone. And of course, we are hiding at AU, right? So so if, if you are interested, right? Also, like um, not just as like a PhD postdocs, but also if you're interested in remote collaborations, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay, so with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. All right. So 